Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. People are complex, and sometimes they defy easy description. Many have made the case that we all have an innate tendency to search for understanding to find meaning in our lives, and that includes the other people in our lives. People who, like Walt Whitman, contradict themselves and contain multitudes. So in our effort to understand, do we have to keep categorizing and putting labels on each other? Well, probably not, but here's one reason why we do. It's how language works. Language requires that we categorize things. When you learn a word, you need to learn that the word can describe some things, but not others, unless you learn what categories things fall into. Some of these words or categories become so common that you need a word to describe everything that isn't in that category, and an antonym is created, and thus you have two binary categories. There's reason to believe this is innate. Noam Chomsky argued that humans have an innate capacity for organizing language that leads to some common universal patterns. This is sometimes called the theory of universal grammar, meaning that across most cultures in the world, there appear to be a few common features to languages. There are criticisms of this idea. For example, one Indonesian language is often argued to have no distinction between nouns and verbs. But this kind of exception is rare, and it illustrates just how common some of these universal features are. So these categorical distinctions might work for dogs and cats, and maybe even some abstract concepts like good and bad, but the real world isn't always so clear-cut. In objective reality, there are spectra, continuums, shades of gray that represent gradations between and within categories. And of course, when we apply this kind of categorical understanding to people, ignoring all the subtlety and nuance and diversity within groups, it leads to stereotypes and prejudices that do real harm to people. So how do we fight that if we've got these brains that seem to really want to put things into categories so we can label them and use our words to describe them? How do we bypass the oversimplified either-or categories to symbolize the spectra and shades of gray that are what you actually tend to find in reality? Fortunately, humans have another symbolic language, one that allows us to say that something is only partially in a category, or only has a chance of being a certain way. Numbers! Now, a number shouldn't be mistaken for an objective truth about something. There's always the possibility of inaccuracy or imprecision in what the number's representing. But imagine if you could only describe a person's height as tall or short but then someone comes along and invents a tape measure. Even a crummy tape measure with crudely drawn, inconsistent marks is going to give you a better understanding of people's height than just the words tall and short. But when you're talking about measuring a human being instead of just, like, how tall something is, there's a lot of opportunity for inconsistency. The numbers may not lie, but there are plenty to choose from. However, this is at least a system that says things don't have to be just one way or the other. So if we're going to start looking at how to measure people's personalities, we'll want to start here, with variation in responses. There are two other things that psychologists are concerned about whenever they measure anything about a person. Is whatever they're measuring giving consistent results? And can that measurement predict some behavior or some other outcome? The words they use for these questions are reliability and validity. To illustrate why these are important, consider the Barnum effect. Bertram Forer gave a personality test to all the students in his class, but then he ignored their responses and gave them all an identical list of uselessly vague personality traits supposedly tailored to each of them. On average, the class rated the descriptions as 4.26 on a 5-point scale of accuracy. As long as the participants trust the person giving the test, and the results have enough positive points to them, they will tend to rate these meaningless statements as accurate. Needless to say, this description won't predict much about any individual student's behavior. It doesn't even meet this first condition of variation in responses. Forer argued that they rated the statements as accurate because they found the results meaningful to them. Which brings up the distinction between personality and identity. Identity describes how people incorporate memories and ideas about themselves into a cohesive self-concept that might motivate them or give meaning to their lives. Now, if you take a personality test and you like the result, you might make a point of incorporating it into your identity, whether it predicts anything about your behavior or not. So let's see if we can do better at finding a nuanced assessment of personality than just ignoring the person entirely and making something up. One personality trait that's been studied for about a hundred years is the idea of introversion and extroversion. The idea has changed quite a bit since Carl Jung's first reports on the subject, but the basic idea has been that extroverts are more social and are energized by other people, whereas introverts can be exhausted by being social, even if they enjoy it. There is some neurological evidence for this understanding, specifically that introverts experience more cortical arousal to a variety of different stimuli, including social stimuli. You may be familiar with this trait if you've ever taken the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator Test. This test places you 
you into one of 16 categories based on four dichotomies, the first of which is introversion and extroversion. However, you're probably keeping in mind that having just two categories is rarely the whole story. There's a continuum from extremely introverted to extremely extroverted people. Most people, in fact, aren't at the extremes. They're in the middle. Now, if you imagine the spectrum has 100 points on it, the last thing you'd want to do is draw a straight line down the middle and then say people on one side of the line are fundamentally different from people on the other. Since there's always a little inaccuracy and inconsistency, people might respond slightly differently taking the test a second time, depending on things like what time of day it is and whether they're hangry. And since most people are near the middle, it's really likely that people would get a new categorization that second time. Unfortunately, this is exactly what the Myers-Briggs does. It makes sure that everyone, including those people really close to the middle, are pushed to one side or the other. This means that the Myers-Briggs does really badly on this second criteria, reliability. Half the people who take the test get a new categorization in as little as five weeks. It makes it really hard for your type to predict any outcome if your type has a 50% chance of changing in that short a time. And in fact, it doesn't. A review that looked at a variety of different behaviors found few consistent relationships with your Myers-Briggs type. And this is before we ask the question of whether the traits we're assessing make any sense in the first place. My favorite example is the trait that treats thinking and feeling as opposites. Although it's probably best to treat these ideas as independent, they're more often positively correlated, not opposites. In fact, one study found that the best way to predict someone's emotional intelligence is to use their score on a test of general intelligence and a test of another personality trait called agreeableness. To quote Adam Grant, people with stronger thinking and reasoning reasoning skills are also better at recognizing, understanding, and managing emotions. It's not that the idea of measuring introversion versus extroversion or other things like intuition and judgment are fundamentally bad ideas, it's just that the Myers-Briggs kinda does a bad job of it. In our effort to understand people, we should avoid making our understanding worse in the process. Measuring more categories yields a more complicated picture, but not necessarily a more accurate one. But since people tend to think in categories, any attempt to do better is gonna have an uphill battle to win over our hearts and minds. But still we will try in the next episode. See you then, and thanks for watching.